Right, everybody, welcome to uh, another episode of the No Emotion podcast. Today, we have Molly Elmore, who we are just talking off camera here. We're just discussing how uh, Molly's probably looked at the price and made price predictions and models and valuations for an XRP more than basically anyone out there. <laughs> and so one of the questions that we will get into in this uh, episode is about the XRP price valuation. Maybe we'll get to see okay. what Molly really thinks um, sure. outside of the modeling and valuations that have been done so far. Um, welcome, Molly, to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Lewis. It's so good to see you again and be a guest on your show. Yeah. Well, I want to ask the first question sure. about what is exciting you the most right now? about not just well, well we'll we'll say crypto to start with and then we'll get more specific to the XRP world. So I spent a lot of my time thinking about and talking about the next financial system that is coming and this sort of internet of value idea and the more I discuss it and kind of go down that rabbit hole the ways it's going to change life as we know it are like limitless. So I'm excited for it. I think it's going to be maybe stressful for people who are not preparing for it or looking ahead to see how the blockchain is going to just revolutionize all aspects of money and business and commerce. So I'm, I'm, that's probably what I'm the most excited about. And I'm almost to the point where I'm getting impatient where I'm like, okay, let's get this show on the road. I'm ready for the internet of value to be part of our daily lives. Yeah. I think, I think the, you, we can all see on, on different social media platforms, the impatience. Um, and people have that that threshold of where they're so impatient, then they start kind of lashing out. We've we've seen that. I'm not going to bring up names, but um, you know we've seen it out there. It's, it's very frustrating, and I think it speaks to the level of impatience. Um, mm-hmm. And and really, to to be fair, it's kind of warranted because it has been a while in many of these assets. It's been a long time since anything's happened. Um, we're at the bottom of a bear market. I believe it's the bottom unless there's a further like apocalyptic crash to happen um, that would create that conversion of the financial system. But um, yeah, I just, we, we are also feeling it, you know, is, is the point. But we we have to try to treat each other properly. <laughs> even when And I hang out that. with a launch of entrepreneurs. That's, I kind of, my early career was in the internet technology space. I'm used to things moving fast. And so this idea that we're kind of waiting for the banking system to make their move, it's like, could you go any slower? Like mm. they're they're the opposite of the sort of types of businesses that I'm used to dealing with. So it just feels like it's very drawn out. And I understand the banking system needs stability and they don't move quickly. And so it's just a test on my patience. Yeah. What? How do you think it's actually going to look when what is the what is the catalyst what's the is there an event that forces like what's the the straw that breaks the camel's back i see it as actually a game theory play okay. where okay. once the first major player starts to transact using blockchain payments it'll get attention but nothing major will change then the second one will come and it'll be like woo But then once there are three, and I don't know if these are necessarily going to be three central banks or three countries or three major, major businesses transacting using this, then it will be the tipping point. And it will sort of cross this point where now everybody who's not doing it has to catch up and kind of scramble. Is that because of the, the competitive advantage that those three would have? Correct. It's, it's sort of like if you go back in time to when we had fax machines and then if most a business started to use email, but you were like, hey, can I send it to you by fax? I mean, there'd be a point where you're just using the outdated system. And uh, it from a business perspective, it could make you look antiquated. So there also will be great marketing value for the businesses that are announcing that they're on this new platform. So I think it's going to be some pressure competitive wise and societally wise or whatever to make sure that once this new stuff is in place that everybody kind of catches up Mm. i kind of my first thought when i when i think about the first company that starts using it 
like properly we're not talking about ripple net we're talking we're talking on demand liquidity at full scale all the transactions that they're trying to put through they they're putting through the blockchain my mind goes immediately to bank of america just because they've made it publicly known mm -hmm. that they're going to be using it is are there any other players that you know of that have talked about it publicly that i've that we might have missed i mean imagine if amazon decided tomorrow that they're only doing blockchain payments i mean something mm -hmm. like that would be this game changer where the volume i mean imagine how much amazon gives to visa and mastercard every month for credit card transactions right we're talking about a serious amount of money now i know that bank to bank and cross border payments is sort of the first use case but i don't know if that will wake up the world the same way something like amazon moving to these payments system. do you think it's actually when you say wake up the world who who are you talking about you're talking about the the average joe we're talking about waking up the people in charge of these central banks and large entities no waking up the average joe who thinks <clears throat> crypto and blockchain is either one some sort of like scam thing or two that it's so far in the future that they don't have to care about it now but what what do people do every day where are they spending money a large group of people myself included buy stuff on amazon it's you know the, the largest sort of global store essentially and that is just an example of something that is generally technology forward i mean amazon is a leader in their space absolutely the built their uh, recommendation engine a collaborative filter that they were one of the first companies to build something like that they are advanced in tech and they have a painful and expensive problem, which is usually the key to adopting new technology, which is they spend a lot of money on credit card transaction fees. Mm. That is a very significant, I don't, I'm just going to say it's probably like hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in that three to 4%. So if I were in charge of Amazon profitability, I'd be like, hey, you know what? This could be a big deal for us and they could move move the market. So that's just an example. I don't think it only has to be Amazon, but something like that would be a tipping point that I was referring to. Yeah, yeah. I just I just kind of feel personally that nothing for the average Joe, the average sheeple, okay. nothing's going to change. Mm -hmm. I don't think they care. I think they want to tap their card and carry okay. on. And I think that's that doesn't awesome. change. Um. I think the where it makes the real difference are the individuals who are running the companies who've unlocked this new technology that in the background essentially makes them 60% more profit. You know, on, on those transaction fees. I think they care. I don't think I, I just don't see my my grandparents going, what's this uh, crypto stuff about? They just pay what they have to pay on the card that they have got used to. Another way I think things could change for the masses is if we start to see business models based on streaming payments. That's such a new idea and could revolutionize how you pay your phone bill, how you pay your water bill. And that's something that everyday people would notice if this counterparty risk of like waiting mm. till the end of the month to pay versus paying in advance. I also think uh, it could change how people get paid for their like jobs. And so that is something that I think will also wake people up and realize, huh, something has clearly changed. And now new businesses that weren't financially feasible because of the way payments worked will be, will grow. I think that's going to take longer. I mean, that's sort of like the Uber idea that nobody thought Uber would be a thing until the internet gained such adoption that people started to think creatively about new ways to, to structure businesses. Yeah, and I actually, I actually, I really agree with you there. Uh, they will know the public will notice when they can clock into their job and then they're getting paid into their wallet every hour that they right. work, and that there's like a difference there. So um, you'll need a wallet. That's the one thing that people will have to do. Now, I I equate that to when online banking apps first came out. That felt like a weird thing, and some people were like nervous and stressed about. How do I do this? How do I use this app? But you just like use it and it's not that hard. Yeah. Wallets will be, it might even be in your banking app, the wallet, but there'll be some kind of technology component that people have to sign into Yeah. that will wake them That's, up. And that would be directly linked to your government issued ID or, or, or whatever. Yeah, maybe. We'll see. I think that in the UK and in Europe, the CBDCs will probably come first. 
Yep. Uh, the commercial banks in the U.S. still have a lot of clout and unless, they don't really want to get cut out of the flow of money. So there has to be a way for the U.S. commercial banks to still maintain their power control. Um, I think for their, I don't, I don't, I'm not too bullish on there being a U.S. retail CBDC unless something major changes with who's in charge right now the commercial banks are. So what would the U.S.'s solution be in that instance? There are a couple of different ways you can do CBDCs functionally, meaning that it's a value ultimately issued by the central bank or the treasury. And then it kind of goes in like a wholesale CBDC to the commercial banks who then issue stable coins. So then mm -hmm. that's what I think will happen in the U.S. There will be um, a process for you to legally issue a stable coin. You're going to have to be one of the banks who is probably a member of the Fed who gets that license to do that. I mean, this could change depending on if the Fed were to hypothetically go away and we no longer had that, but let's just assume we still have the Fed. The Fed still has power. There are still shareholders in the Fed who are large US commercial banks. That's who I think will get those licenses and that's how they protect their monopoly. Okay. You're, you're giving me lots of food for thought here, actually. I like this this perspective. Um, my, I kind of... When when I'm having these conversations online with with people about how this new financial system is going to look, I find that the typical response from those I'm talking to is is very much based in the way the system is now. Um, like for example, you said the Fed. We don't know if that's going to continue. It might. It very well might. Of course, it might, might be rebranded or put into a different name or. They do something else with like their roles and responsibilities. Um, but when I think the most opposition people give is from that side, we don't have something like that right now. So well, there isn't such a thing to to hold gold and make it the asset that backs a currency. There's no such thing for as a world reserve currency, like a, a, a one world currency. Um, there's, but the, the point is, is like when the, when the financial system changes, there will be changes to made to entities. The entities will disappear. New ones will come up to to mm -hmm. fit that new system. So I wonder what you think about what kind of entities in the U.S. I, I would say and global, if if you if you're able to, what what ones are most likely to disappear? So I think we've actually had a one world currency for a long time, and it's been the dollar. It's been the dominant global trade currency. That doesn't mean that there were never other currencies, but most global trade since the 1970s, especially, has been conducted in dollars. Energy is sort of runs the world. Oil has been bought and sold in dollars. So let's say, well, that problem, that system is broken, right? The U.S. has abused that power. They've invaded countries that will not, you, you know, don't want to do that system. It's been used as a political tool. And I think many other nations in the world are sort of fed up with that. And sort of why the BRICS countries have formed their own alliance to say, we just don't want to deal with this dollar system anymore because it's not in our advantage. It's also totally unfair that one nation has the power to print these dollars. No other nation does. So mm -hmm. if I want to trade with you, I can just make up money, but you can't, you've got to go dig oil out of the ground or gold or whatever. So if there, that's why XRP as a world reserve currency idea is sort of in the interest of global peace, because no one nation can just print XRP. No one nation has that unfair advantage. So this idea of a level playing field, which we talk about a lot in the XRP space, is I think that there's going to be currency parity. And it's going to revolve around having a neutral currency that is not issued by a particular central bank or even controlled by a central bank. Now, let's say hypothetically Ripple did become the U.S. central bank. That's a theory that's been tossed around there. They're more like a manager of XRP. They don't get they can't make more XRP or print it or decide who gets to use it. it you know, anyone can can trade in it. It might be something that you have to be an institutional business to do, but it wouldn't be like, well, if you're a Russian central bank, you can't use XRP. I mean, this was sort of the theory that if the dollar trajectory had stayed, we might have ended up in a very serious World War III. How could we avoid that by having more of a neutral currency? Does this mean like 
the IMF and the World Bank go away? Like, I don't know, to be honest. I don't know if they what their role would be in a decentralized world where there is a neutral bridge currency. Each nation could essentially have their own sovereign currency. But the thesis we have with the XRP valuation model, some of them, is that eventually that just becomes unnecessary. And if XRP were to be the global reserve currency, why do you need all these national currencies? Because you're just going to be constantly switching your thing into that, which is just um, friction. Yeah. Um, so just for people who maybe aren't familiar with that kind of thought process, the essentially, and, and disagree with me if I slip up. Okay. You essentially got XRP at the top. Correct. Uh, I guess in the custody of Ripple, but not controlled by Ripple, something in that capacity right now ripple has this escrow which mm -hmm. means they have about 50 billion ish that are kind of locked in smart contracts that very likely have been promised to other people via like an options agreement i see so i wouldn't now this is semantics but i don't know if i would say that ripple like owns that xrp they it was gifted to them i believe you know but they are have this agreement to sell it so that it can be used as a utility asset and as a store of value. Right. So you have the XRP at the top, mm -hmm. however that looks in terms of the semantics of it. Right. And then below that, you have each independent country's CBDC. Right. As their own sovereign currency. Correct. We believe that the rails for the payments made in those CBDCs will be, uh, will, will all go through the XRP ledger and XLM and the, you know, the st stellar stuff as well. I agree. That's the general idea that those sovereign currencies will be stable and able to uh, convert easily into a physical version of that, of the CBDC, which I guess will be like the initial phasing out of physical money. What I want to see what you think about is what do you think about the idea of each one of the CBDCs from each country being pegged to the the strong the largest commodity produced by the individual country? Hmm. So it could be different for each nation. Yes. So, like uh, Uganda might be diamonds. I know the UK would probably be ster sterling silver. I like that. I I had considered it being a basket where if you were a nation that produced multiple, like basically you get to pile up all the stuff that you make and that becomes tokenized value on the blockchain, which is how you would mint your CBDC. Yes. And it, the problem with doing gold is that some nations have a bunch of gold underground and some nations don't. So it's not really fair if you pick just one asset. So even if I refer to return to the gold standard in this conversation, I'm talking about lots of physical assets because many of them have value. I mean, it could be diamonds, as you said, silver. It could be some kind of uh, oil, food commodity. There's yep. a bunch of things. Even a manufactured product, hypothetically, could be something yep. steel. I mean, you could make a bunch of steel and kind of collateralize that as money. Yeah. There, there was a, a gentleman by the name of Simon Hunt. I bring him up all the time because mm -hmm. every time... I hear something about backing an asset. I always think about what he said. And he said, you would have a one, you'd have a currency at the center of it all, and it would be backed by a basket of 20 commodities. He's that's what he said. And he's yeah. he's a guy who understands the backing system. Um, one of my favorite topics to debate with my uh XRP developer friends <laughs> mm -hmm. is this notion of whether or not XRP could be backed by something. Let's just pick gold as an example, but it could be anything. And um, they love to disagree with me and say, no, it cannot. But I'm firmly in the camp that people can do whatever they want. And if a bunch of people who happen to have control over a significant percentage of, of XRP, I'm not saying this is Ripple, this could be like all the central banks, they could decide that they are now going to redeem XRP for whatever asset they want. I mean, you and I could create a private like poker game with five of our friends and we might decide that XRP is how we're going to settle up at the end of the night. And we could decide, hey, you know what? In our little group, we're going to swap out XRP for chunks of gold. 
we could do it. You could say that's dumb, but like we could do it and yeah. it could be done at scale. Uh, so I'm, I am curious to see how this happens with tokenization of physical assets and whether assets that are already issued like XRP or XLN can be retroactively backed by something. I think that if pe enough people want to do it, they can do it. Yeah, I agree. If you, if you can, if you can back a dollar by a dollar, you can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And there used to be this, this, another debate, like, well, you can't fix the price of XRP or set the price, but I'm like, well, they set the price of gold. And you could go dig up more gold tomorrow. And so the people who set the price didn't own all the gold. They just owned enough that they controlled the market. And anybody could, I could dig up my own gold and sell it to you for 10 times what the price was. And you could buy it. No one says you can't do that. Uh, and we yeah. have, the, I think we live in an era where markets are so manipulated and that upsets people to accept that reality, that there's still this hope like we have a free market markets control the prices markets you know have this natural energy and dynamic but i don't think there certainly is not a free market for gold there's certainly not a free market for xrp i don't even know if there's a free market even in the whole stock exchange and bond yeah. markets so. yeah I, I received a a voice note from a, a subscriber who was he, he was great but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna uh, say his name but he sent me a message saying i've just had an idea about a set price for XRP and a reason why that is actually not, not, I wouldn't say likely scenario, but fully feasible. And that was, he, he gave the, the example of BlackRock and he said, BlackRock know how many assets in the dollar value of the assets, they know that exact amount. And it's a large, large numbers. I think it's in the region of 10 million. And then with a partner, it's like 11 and a half or something, a trillion. Yeah. Really. Yeah, <laughs> um, what if because you and i when we when we buy some xrp we know the price isn't going to move with our purchase or with our activity we know nothing's going to happen because we're not big enough of a player but if you are big enough of a player and you know exactly how much how many assets you have and what would happen to the xrp price if you for example added tokenized all of your assets onto the ledger hypothetically you'd be able to calculate your impact if you're a big enough player and so if you calculate your own impact you know exactly where the price would go if you made your move as a result you could make your move and or before you make your move just buy up from the secondary market and in the transition of making your move you make a massive profit because you know where the price is going. And then a level above that is what if BlackRock talked to every other massive asset manager company? What if they talked to all the central banks and they know exactly where the price would go if they ran everything through it? You know, those conversations, I find it actually hard to believe that those conversations haven't happened. Even if I agree. At, at least within just BlackRock. But they all I actually do. think it's happening within the European banks. A lot of European banks are in trouble. They look insolvent, which means they owe more than they have in assets. Mm -hmm. They've been buying up gold for a long time. And this is another sort of black swan event that could be a catalyst to see a big change is that a bunch of banks in Europe could be other otherwise. It just looks like it's going to happen in Europe to me. They fail. And there's this transition process where they get kind of converted using a bail-in to a, a revaluation of gold and XRP. So let's say you own 10 pounds of gold or whatever, and it's worth a million dollars, but you owe 10 million, you, you look insolvent. Well, what if all of a sudden I revalued your gold and now your gold is worth a trillion? You all of a sudden look magically like you have tons of money and you can use that to issue your new CBDC or whatever currency you have. So- there's a very vested interest in the banking system in revaluing gold and revaluing XRP, which they also hold, or at least have options agreements to buy at a certain point. This is where my impatience comes in. Yeah. Like we see this, we're waiting. We don't know what this trigger will be, but I would, I mean, I'm very confident that if the banking system in Europe specifically collapsed, it would trigger collapses elsewhere. And one of the solutions to that would be to massively hike up the price of gold 
and XRP so that it looks like a problem that's been solved. Yeah. Do you think there's, there, I feel like there's a difference between setting a set price for XRP and the understanding that your influence would create a price of XRP. True. Like the mechanism by which that happens, I think, I don't know, like it could be a couple of different things, how they literally do it. I mean, back in 1985, they had this thing called the Plaza Accord, where a bunch of nations met and they decided what their exchange rates were going to be in currencies. They'd had free floating currencies that you could trade, but they said, you know what, we got this problem. The dollar's too strong. Mm. We have to fix this. And the banks and nations made this agreement. So that is one scenario that could easily happen is a Plaza Accord type thing where the nations agree, hey, you know what, we're going to revalue our currencies in gold. And by doing that, it hikes up the price of gold. The other thing that could happen is we know the price of gold is suppressed, right? Because of this business with paper gold and naked shorts, and they have the system to short the price. Well, that only works if you if there's like one ex or two exchanges that you control. What if the Russia exchange opens and the price of gold is not suppressed and they just start selling gold at $30,000 an ounce or $100,000 an ounce. Guess what's going to happen? All the gold from the West would leave and people would take it over to Russia and sell it. And now the New York or the Chicago, wherever they sell gold in the US and London would be empty. Yep. And all the gold would go to Russia, which is like in the terms of national security, like a really bad thing. So they might have to raise the price to prevent gold leaving the West. So I think yeah. there's a couple different ways it could play out. That would be a true market dynamic, like an arbitrage type thing where the price, and then nobody's going to fight it and they're going to look like, oh no, look how bad Russia is for opening this exchange. But really all of these Western banks will be ecstatic because now their assets are going to be worth a ton. Yeah, absolutely. It just seem, it seems logical that that's the, that's the flow of the, the way the events go. Because... Mm -hmm there is a blatant solution for them they all know it right so impatience <laughs> yes flip the switch please come on i get it it's yeah. sort of one of those things though we're gonna one day we'll wake up and it will have happened it's like a trip that's so far in the future you're like this trip is never gonna come but then one day you wake up and you get on the plane yeah i like the way you put that that's really good so that that actually naturally flows perfectly to the so the big question, sure. out of all of the valuations you've done, all the calculations, the research, which I have to congratulate you and your, and your brain for all of this is like the, the level of effort and the way you nice and simply display it on those infographics is uh, well done for all of that. That's a lot of work. Um, what do you think about where the price of XRP is going to go, not just in this coming bull run, if you can even call it that, because that's very much based on a spe speculative environment. Um, wh where's the XRP price going to go? First thing I want to clarify, I didn't build any of the models. So I'm on a team of people. There's like eight or nine of us. Some people are more active than others. And there were six other people who built models. One was the Anthony Michnik ones, which we didn't really build. But what my role was to take what was built and kind of convert it into an explanation that's easy for people to understand who are not model builders. The benefit to me was that I had to study each of these six models to the point where I could, ex could explain them to someone else. And what I ended up, the place I am at now, because all six have been built, we still have one infographic to release, is that I think they are all true in different scenarios. And it really helped me understand that the Utility aspect of XRP is incredibly powerful, meaning you can process 1,500 transactions a second. You can move a tremendous amount of value. That's incredibly efficient, but it's not a big price driver. Like if trillions and even a quadrillion dollars started to move through that, that's not going to jack the price of XRP up astronomically. The big variable that will affect the price of XRP is whether or not people choose to store value in XRP the same way they've stored value in gold. What that does is it removes it from the supply for transactions and it can make the price be astronomical. The other thing that people have a hard time with and me included is 
if we had to have the price of XRP be high enough that it could be a store of value potentially for all the money, how high would that have to be? Well, first question is, well, what exactly is all the money? Do we have to just cover all the money we have today? Or do we have to talk about gold that might get dug up in 10 years or some rare metal that we're going to mine in an asteroid in five years? And that's where the the really high valuation numbers are coming from is it's almost like an insurance policy. If we had to make sure we could cover all the value now and in the future so we don't have to go through a revaluation of XRP again, how high does that need to be? There's really no risk for a central bank to have an extremely high value of XRP. There's no risk to Ripple for it to be a lot, a very high price, right? There are risks if it's too low and there's a liquidity crisis. Yep. So this idea that like these astronomically, what feel like astronomically high valuations seem unreasonable. It's like, well, they are going to revalue, like they're going to revalue gold. It's safer in the interest of financial stability to give it a really high price because you won't run into the problems that would happen if the price were too low. And financial systems need stability. They do not want price volatility. Let's say you're a country and you are taking out a loan and XRP is your collateral for your loan. If the price dropped because of some market event, you're going to get margin called on your loan, right? You're going to have to put up more collateral. So keeping the price of XRP very, very high and stable benefits countries, banks, everybody. So uh, I guess I've had this conversation so many times now, like it doesn't feel weird to me that XRP could be $100,000 a token or even half a million dollars a token, because that actually serves the banks who are the ones who get to make these decisions. Uh, extremely well put. I, I really appreciate the the humility and the effort you've put forward as well. Um, and and your, your contribution to the community should not go unnoticed, in my opinion. Thank you. Um, so I, I appreciate you spending the time with me. I think we're just about out of time right now. Okay. Um, I hope we get to do this again. Uh, I've, I've really, right. really enjoyed it. And you've you've made my my brain bend in thought. So I really, really appreciate that. All right. Well, I'm happy to come back anytime you'd like me to. Love that. Thank you.